This is Ray Mossholder. Thomas Jefferson said one man with courage is a majority. This from the Economic Collapse Chronicles by Mark Goodwin. We're in chapter 37. Paul Randall set his bags by Larry Jacobs' front door. Larry said, Paul, I hope this isn't about you being afraid you're wearing out your welcome. If there's anything I can do to be a better host, you just let me know. Randall took Kimberly's day bag off his shoulder and set it near the luggage. Well, you could write a book on hospitality, Larry. You've made us feel right at home. Feel it isn't wise to have too many high-value targets in one place. I see your point, Paul. But we have a very good security plan here at the ranch. If you return home, you're going to have to make some serious modifications. Randall replied, Well, the general said he'll take care of all that. We have to think about continuity of leadership. The security here at your ranch is fantastic, Larry, but nothing's impregnable. Do you think how wouldn't hit us with a drone strike? One missile from a reaper could eradicate all of us. But we can catch a reaper with our radar, Larry said. Can you pick up an RQ-180? The, those are just for surveillance, Paul continued to build this case. How hard would it be to put a payload on it? You could strap one AGM-114 Hellfire to the RQ-180 and hardly increase the radar signature. If you stripped out the interior of all the surveillance equipment, you could put in a bomb bay and not increase the radar signature at all. It only takes one, Larry. Larry nodded in agreement. Well, you'll be missed. It's been nice having you around. Promise you won't be a stranger. You won't miss me, Larry. You're at the half point between the general and me, so the face-to-face -face meetings will all be here. You'll be charging us rent by the time this conflict is over. Larry laughed but insisted that it was no trouble at all. Larry and his wife Allison walked them to their SUV. General Alan Jefferson had arranged for a military security motorcade to escort the Randalls back to their ranch. Sonny Foster accompanied them back to their home. The ride home was pretty exciting. Part of the security protocol was to drive quite fast. This made it difficult for a planned attack to time an impact or explosive device. When they arrived home, Kimberly stated, this house is a mess. Military contractors were all around the property. The lead contractor approached the Randalls. He greeted them and began to explain what was being done. We're installing ballistic glass in all the windows. A safe room has been installed as well as a below ground bunker. The bunker has been placed adjacent to the house. We dug a short tunnel under the concrete footer of the garage. It's accessible via a trap door in the garage. The bunker also has an exit tunnel that leads out to the cattle barn. General Jefferson instructed us to spare no expense in making you safe. Paul said, but well, we sure do appreciate all the hard work. It was the first time Kimberly had been home since Robert had been killed. She walked into his room, sat on his bed, and began to cry. 
palm followed and sat down beside her. He pulled her close to comfort her. And after several minutes of crying, Kimberly took a deep breath, looked at Paul and smiled softly as she embraced him. Sonny came to the doorway. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but there's a phone call for Paul. I'll take it, Sonny. Paul said he kissed his wife on the forehead, got up from the bed to answer that phone. General, Paul said, the house looks great. Oh, man, this is fantastic. The contractor showed me the door to the bunker. We just got home, so I haven't had a chance to check it out yet, but it's the next thing I'm going to do. Well, I'm glad you like it, Paul. I'll, buy, I'll be by in a few days to point out some of the extraordinary features. The below-ground bunker has its own oxygen source, so you can't get smoked out or have tear gas injected into the ventilation system. There's enough oxygen to last you about a week. The airlock feature has to be engaged for the oxygen to kick in. There's enough food and water to keep eight people alive for three months. I took the liberty of placing a pretty serious weapons cache down there as well. I know how you like to shoot. Hopefully you'll never need any of it, but if you get bored and decide to shoot your way out, you'll have that option. <clears throat> Before I get sidetracked here, that's not why I'm calling. The House Judiciary Committee is pushing to have the president impeached and subsequently detained. Couldn't get any traction because all of the representatives from the coalition states have dropped out of Congress to serve in their states. It's really just a fistful of establishment Republicans from both houses that are trying to let the president know they still have a say. How is it having it? He's had them all detained. This might be a good time to see who else we could get to make a commitment to the coalition. There's still a lot of red states out there that are trying to stay neutral. Paul joked, well, the Ides of March is next week. I suppose if anyone is trying to proclaim themselves emperor for life, this is a good time to be locking up any dissenters in the Senate. General Jefferson laughed. Put out your feelers. See who's interested in joining the coalition. Arizona had a few representatives detained. West Virginia had one very popular senator locked up. Don't make anyone any promises about dedicating military support to evict federal offices or take over military bases in their states. We're going to be focusing all our attention on taking Minot Air Force Base. Once that is out of the way, we can discuss what's next on our agenda. Sounds like a plan, General. I'll call them around and see where the leadership is at. The more the merrier. Take care. Paul finished and hung up the phone. It operated via encrypted VOIP. His next calls were to the governors of North and South Dakota. They had just joined the coalition, and there was much to discuss with them. Paul needed to speak about border security, shutting down federal offices, and taking control of the military bases in their states. Unfortunately, they were not yet set up with the encrypted VOIP software that the rest of the coalition leadership was using. Paul told the governor of North Dakota, 
Governor, I'll be sending a delegate from the coalition to meet you with you this week. This delegate was actually the coalition security IT specialist that would be getting them set up with the encryption software so they could have private conversations. Traveling across the federal states was too risky for leadership, but communication was vital to the effort. The governor of North Dakota agreed to receive the delegate just as the governor of South Dakota did. Next, Paul Randall called the governors of Arizona and West Virginia. The governor of Arizona said, we're sympathetic to the coalition, but we're just not ready to make a commitment. West Virginia governor said essentially the same thing. State legislature just unsure at this particular juncture. I'm sure you understand. Paul understood all right. I understand that you're choosing tyranny because you're a bunch of cowards. He thought to himself. Chapter 38. The trifling economy of paper as a cheaper medium or its convenience for transmission weighs nothing in opposition to the advantage of the precious metals. It's liable to be abused has been, is, and forever will be abused in every country in which it's permitted. Who said that about paper money? Thomas Jefferson. Matt sat on his porch and drank his coffee quietly in the cool mountain air. He considered how much life had changed all over America. Nothing about it looked the same as six months ago. The decline had been coming steadily for years. But the past few months brought about a sharp crash that changed the living standards of every American. Even the rich felt it. They could no longer go to their favorite restaurant in the hot part of town. Restaurants were non-existent. The restaurants that had clientele who could absorb the rapid increases in prices held on until the dollar completely failed. But after that, they locked the doors. The news told stories of home invasions that had erupted in upscale neighborhoods. The days of picking up the phone and calling 911 were long gone. Those who had the foresight to have items available for barter could hire former police officers or former military personnel for security. There was a growing market for security work among the affluent who had something to pay with. Unfortunately, before the crash, many of the so-called upper class were living above their means to keep up appearances. Large portion of those were truly wealthy prior to the collapse, and all of the wealth tied up in the stock market or in cash. Those with vast sums of cash in the mattress were no better off. Those would, if they hadn't converted their dollars to hard assets, before the dollar bit the dust, the money was use, useful only for kindling or wallpaper. Then Matt considered the working class like Karen and himself. The middle class was entirely wiped out. There were no more jobs and suburban landscapes had been transformed into wastelands run by gangs and criminals. Those that had somewhere to go left. 
Those that didn't weren't able to survive. Food was pretty much gone in all metropolitan areas. The last remaining bits of food in warehouses and convenience stores were stripped out by gangs and looters. The news showed that the military was doing everything it could to keep the soldiers fed, but millions of civilians were dying of starvation. The gangs turned to cannibalism and were feeding on other humans to survive. Rural areas, that was a different story. Those fared much better, depending on whether they were the, in the federal states or the coalition states. According to reports on alternative media sites, in the federal states, the military had begun going house to house to collect supplies to distribute to the needy. The needy ended up being the military. Cattle, pigs, poultry, eggs, and stored food were commandeered for the good of the country. Farmers were left enough to survive on so they could continue to produce goods. They were promised compensation once the new currency was established. In the coalition states like Kentucky, barter networks were developing. People pitched in to help each other out. Many folks had taken Paul Randall's advice and converted their dollars into silver, gold, ammunition, tools, storable foods, toiletries, and the things that would they would need to get by until manufacturing and trade with other nations could be reestablished. In London, Kentucky, and many other small towns, people were setting up flea markets in the abandoned parking lots of Walmart and other big box retailers. Few people had enough stored fruit and vegetables to trade, but spring was just around the corner. With a high demand for canned vegetables at the flea markets, you could be sure lots of farmers would be devoting large plots of land to produce. Meat was priced high, but was available if you had the right currency. Many cattle farmers, like Adam, killed cattle to feed their own families. They would often end up with more than they could store, so the flea markets made a good outlet to get rid of extra meat. They would typically sell it to someone at the market with a booth. As this trend continued, entire booths became dedicated to butchers. Butcher booths were often run by the very butchers who lost their jobs at the big box grocers and retailers. Besides beef, the butchers regularly carried venison, rabbit, chicken, pork, and various other wild game. There was no FDA to regulate the butchers. However, the free market quality weeded out anyone who sold foul-smelling meat or failed to keep a tidy workspace. Customers simply chose another vendor. At the flea markets, large transactions typically took place utilizing gold. Gold coins were common, but gold jewelry was accepted by merchants who had scales and the time to figure out the value of the pieces. Jewelry traded at a very slight discount to gold coins. The coins were standardized and weighing wasn't necessary, so the jewelry was viewed as an inconvenience by merchants. Mid-sized transactions were most likely to be made in silver one ounce coins 
fractional silver. It also became popular after the price passed $50 per ounce. In the years leading up to the crash, private mints produced one half, quarter, and tenth ounce silver rounds. This made silver available in the same denominations as gold. While fractional silver had been around for a while, the premiums were too high to bother with until the price shot up. Pre-1965 U.S. silver coins were used as well. While not quite a tenth ounce of silver, pre-1965 silver dimes would buy the same as a tenth ounce silver round. Matt figured that it was a convenience factor, or it may have been the fact that the dimes were old and would never be minted again. Silver dollars, quarters, and half dollars were subject to the merchant. Some accepted them at the value of a quarter ounce, half ounce, or ounce, but most discounted them to their actual silver content. One dollar face value of pre-1965 silver coin contained only seven-tenths of an ounce of silver. Smaller transactions used ammunition for a standardized currency. Different caliber shells held different values. Other popular barter items were soap, razors, deodorant, and makeup. Utility services varied widely across the country as well. When payment for utilities became impossible because of the dollar collapse, military personnel were assigned to keep them operational. The boards of the utility companies signed them over to anyone who could take care of them as they were completely useless as profit centers without a currency. Franklin Johnson told Matt that the services in Texas were uninterrupted. Texas had their own power grid and were completely energy independent and capable of producing all of their own water. The Texas state government assumed operation of the utilities until order and trade could be reestablished. Texas promised to hand control back to the utility companies as soon as they felt they were ready to take over. The Eastern Electrical Grid initially had major problems when maintenance workers and operators began not showing up for work. Many large cities had intermittent service of regular outages during the day, despite military personnel keeping the plants open. Some northern cities were completely dependent on electricity for heat. Matt read that over 100,000 people froze to death that winter. An alternative news source reported that President Howe was looking for ways to have the coalition states cut off while keeping the power on for the federal states. But the interconnectivity of the eastern grid made that impossible. Matt learned from a Kentucky National Guardsman that the southern coalition states were working frantically together to get a centralized grid of their own. The Northwest coalition states worked hard at building their own independent grid as well. They had a bigger challenge as most of their states were part of the Western grid, 
but the new members of the coalition, North and South Dakota, were connected to the Eastern grid. Matt finished his coffee as he recounted the recent events that were creating the new landscape of America. It was barely recognizable as the same nation it had been only months ago. Chapter 39, Ephesians 6.12 For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Howe returned to Mount Weather after sealing the deal with Raventhorne. He assured Secretary of Defense Scott Hale that he'd received bad information and there was no plot inside the White House or his Secret Service to assassinate him after all. It was obvious that something wasn't right about the story from the beginning but Hale wasn't the type to question the president. The week after his return, Anthony's father, Porter Howe, called him. Dad, how are you doing? We're fine, Anthony. You could call him once in a while, you know. I know you're busy, but your mother may not be with us much longer. She hopes to see you sometime soon. Anthony had never been close with his parents. His mother had been a socialite when he was a child, and he'd been raised by his nannies. Soon as he was old, soon as he was old enough for boarding school, he was sent away. He was brought out at parties and paraded around on occasion but they never spent any substantial time together. Anthony Howe didn't resent his parents for it. It was just the way things were for people in his social echelon. While he didn't harbor a grudge against them, he also didn't feel particularly compelled to call or visit. Even now when his mother was dying from lung cancer, he didn't call. Now more than ever, the conversation would be awkward and uncomfortable. He didn't really know the woman and didn't quite know what to say. Are you safe? Hal asked his father. We are. We have private security. They're pretty top notch and they're well connected. What firm, KBR? With the loss of so many U.S. military contracts for logistics and security, they're venturing into international personnel security. The supply and demand curves being what they are, high net worth individuals are seeing the value that justifies the fees KBR charges. Ten years ago, the only way you could afford them is if you had a printing press. Well, things change. I bet Halliburton would like to patch things up with KBR about now, Anthony commented. His father and he could always talk about business together. It was the one thing they had in common. Halliburton is hiring all of these rookies to work at the camps. Rookies can run the FEMA camps, but the prison camps are giving these guards a run for their money. Paul Randall really stirred up a hornet's nest for me. I'm filling up the prison camps as fast as Halliburton can build them. Porter said, son, I'd love to chit chat, but there's something really important that we need to discuss. Anthony replied, I know, mom is sick, but I have a lot of responsibility right now. 
That's not it. Something you need to know. Something you'll want to know. What is it, Dad? You can say whatever you need to. This phone is about as secure as any phone in the world. I need to tell you in person. I'm going to take a helicopter down there. My pilot is with KBR. He has clearance to land at any military installation. Tell Secret Service I'll be there this afternoon. How stammered for an excuse. He was usually so good at that, but he knew this must be important for his father to even call, much less fly down from New York. Okay, How finally said. How thought to himself as he hung up the phone. What could this be? He was puzzled more than anything. Several hours later, Anthony Howe got the call that his father's helicopter was arriving. Anthony Howe rode the elevator to the surface. It was the first time he'd been exposed to natural light since he returned from New York. The Mount Weather physician had encouraged Howe to get up to the surface at least once a day to get some fresh air and keep his spirits up. The doctor was worried that Howe's drinking was affecting his health, but Howe was sensitive about that subject. Even with his sunglasses, the light made him squint. Hal thought to himself, I suppose I rather like the darkness. Seems to suit me better than the sunlight. The helicopter landed and Hal greeted his father. While not close, he didn't like the old man. He had a great amount of respect for him. He admired the way his father had built a financial empire from the ground up. Porter had always made sure Anthony had the best of everything and a good education in all things business and politics. Porter Howe said, I can't stay long. How had grown to expect it. Even when I'm president, he doesn't have time for me he thought. It was a matter-of-fact thought. Anthony Howe had learned not to let that get him down emotionally many years ago. Anthony, you have crossed a dangerous line. I know that you think you're the supreme being of the universe, and why wouldn't you? No one has ever told you any different. Hal wasn't quite sure what his father was saying. He asked, Is this about the prisoner extermination rumors? No, Anthony, it isn't. And we don't have to pretend they're rumors. You did what you had to do. The simple fact is that you've been groomed for this position from birth. Before you were born, it was determined that he'd be brought up with a certain education, certain connections, and a certain path would be laid out for you. Well, I knew you had aspirations for me. Anthony still didn't know where this conversation was going. Not me. We. When I was a young man at Yale, I made a pact with my fraternity that my firstborn child would be brought up into the position of President of the United States. Many men have worked diligently to make certain that this would come to be. A lot of presidents have come from the skull and bones fraternity. All of my fraternity brothers knew we would have influential positions. His father continued, Yes, many of them knew they were to become president. After Kennedy, the men in power decided that it was best 
to let the elect think it was destiny that brought them to their positions. In his speech in April of 1961, Kentucky threatened to expose the very man who had brought his entire family to their glory. Of course, they backed off when he threatened to expose them for a couple of years anyway, but these men are patient. Two years later, as you know, Jack Kennedy learned to keep his mouth shut. After that, no one else was to know the plans the men in power had for them. I shouldn't be telling you this, but you're very close to being eliminated, just like Jack Kennedy. How just listened. His father had always been very level-headed. Anthony Howe knew that being in the skull and bones guaranteed a prominent position, but he'd never thought it meant elections would be decided for him or that there would be men behind the scenes pulling the strings and pretending to be gods. Howe thought, maybe Porter's just getting old. Perhaps his strain of mother's sickness is getting to this old man. Maybe he has Alzheimer's or is in the wrong dose of some medication. Porter continued, is this business with Al Muhammad? He's a protected member. He served the men in power well and his reward is a long life. You can't put yourself in the place of a god. It's up to you if he lives or dies. Anthony Howe's heart dropped to his stomach. How does my father know about this? Who said something? Had to be Darren King. No one else knows anything about this. I don't know what you're talking about. Porter took a stern tone. This isn't a game. This determines if you live or if you die. Your life is in the hands of these men, Anthony. President retorted, Al Muhammad isn't in the skull and bones. I've never seen him at the Grove. I don't know how he ever made it to where he is. Porter spoke with a whisper as if he thought the very wind might hear him. These men are not the skull and bones. Anthony, they are much higher. They're the masters. It's not necessary for him to be a skull. The three presidents before him were skull and bones. At some point, they have to change it up a little. Starts to look a bit odd when you have five presidents in a row from the same Yale fraternity. To make up for this indiscretion, it would be wise of you to take Al Muhammad's counsel on occasion. The masters would like to help you with one of your problems. They have come up with a solution to the defectors from your military. Porter took out a small RFID device. This chip can be a great tool to get control of your armed forces and government employees. Anthony Howe sat stunned as his father continued speaking. He thought, I've seen some very peculiar things during rituals, rituals at Bohemian Grove and of course at Yale, but I never believed in God or any other higher power. There are men in stations of power that I didn't even know about an hour ago. These men are like gods, and I'm a mere mortal. The misfortune of not being the apex predator was a crippling disappointment. 
how took the chip from his father, but he was still stunned by the information. His father stayed only an hour, then boarded his private helicopter and left Anthony alone again. Chapter 40 Thomas Jefferson said, Rightful liberty is unobstructed action according to our will within limits drawn around us by the equal rights of others. I do not add within the limits of the law because law is often but the tyrant's will and always so when it violates the rights of the individual. Eddie Cooper's sister had just come to live with Eddie from Louisville. She told Eddie the horrors of what it was like there. Eddie relayed the information to the rest of the guys from Bravo. At a group meeting days prior, Eddie told everyone the story. Louisville has a very ethnically diverse population. There were gangs prior to the meltdown, but now the ethnic gangs really stick with their own kind. The city is being divided up into strict territories. The Vietnamese hold the south end. Black gangs control the west end. And a new violent Mexican gang is running rampant in the east end of town. The east end had previously been the most affluent, but the Mexican gangs now occupy several neighborhoods through systematic home invasions. My sister stayed in Louisville for so long because she lived in the East and she thought it would be safe. Her husband was killed two days ago and she left. She told me all about the conditions around town when she finally left. There was no economic activity aside from the gangs. There were no flea markets that she knew of. She had heard from a neighbor that there was a small barter network in Okolana, a suburb south, were south of the area held by the Vietnamese. Okolana is the more redneck area most everyone there has a gun, and from what my sister said, they organize their own security. No one goes downtown. All the shops, bars, restaurants, offices, condos, and stores have been looted, and it's a ghost town. The Louisville Municipal Bus Service, known as TARC, has solar panels on the top of every bus stop for safety lighting. My sister said that none of the panels had been taken from her neighborhood, which makes me suspect that they would still be on the bus stops downtown. Seems like the gangs aren't paying attention to the politics that are heating up over the power grid and haven't thought of taking the panels for backup power yet. With this information, Adam devised a plan to go in and get the panels since that area of the city was completely abandoned. Adam's plan was to drive straight into the center of downtown, get as many of the panels as they could carry and get out fast. Matt, Wesley, and Adam loaded into Adam's truck. Adam said, we'll stop near Shelbyville to gear up and put on our tactical gear. It was 4.30 in the morning. Most of the gunfire would be dying down. Adam briefed the team. We'll arrive in downtown Louisville right around 7 a.m. 
the commas part of the day. I'll pull my work trailer to load up with solar panels. JC will follow me in another truck. Gary and Eddie will ride along with JC. Jeff and Lee will follow in a third truck, which is pulling a flatbed trailer. Matt said, JC's truck has no trailer. We could use the old beat up horse trailer that I used to haul everything from Florida. Adam answered, well, I think it would be too much of a target. We're a big enough target just because we have fuel. A horse trailer would make folks assume we have livestock. When people are starving, even honest men may consider making a bad move if they think we have something to eat in that trailer. Adam's truck was full of gas. Matt and Adam had stocked up fuel back when the ration cards first went into effect last year. Every member of the family could get a card. So they took cards for everyone in their group, even Mandy and Carissa. Jeff also stocked up on fuel when it was more available. Conserving fuel was a way of life now. JC's truck was marked flex fuel, which meant it would run on E85. Gary was producing several gallons of fuel, great alcohol, every week to sell at the flea market. Prior to Gary dedicating his life to Christ as a teenager, he had helped his grandfather make moonshine. Kentucky had lifted the prohibition on distilling for personal use after the crash. The state was not encouraging drunkenness. They were encouraging people to be able to take care of themselves. The state recognized the usefulness of moonshine for a fuel alternative and for an antiseptic. Seeing there were no more federal laws in Kentucky prohibiting it, Gary's conscience was free to produce it for fuel and medicinal purposes. Adam continued, three trucks running 300 miles round trip is going to dump a massive amount of fuel, but the payoff could be great. Gasoline and diesel are still available at the flea market, but both fuels are extremely expensive. If we can get enough solar panels, the amount of energy we will harvest from the sun will far surpass what we'll be expending to retrieve it. Solar panels won't fuel trucks, but they will keep us from having to burn more fuel to run generators if the grid goes down. We all know the risk of going down is pretty good. The load being sucked out of the grid by the cities could cause a cascading failure. Besides that, how has proved that he's a hothead. If he could shut down our grid without turning off his own power, he would have already done it. Who knows how long it, that will stop him. He's already proven that he'll kill his own in order to inflict pain on the enemy. The men loaded up and rolled out. All three trucks reached Shelbyville without incident. They pulled off at the exit and met up at an abandoned gas station. Adam gave the last minute instructions. Everybody gear up. You six are going to be working security. Matt and I will be removing the panels and JC will be loading them into the trucks and trailers. Matt, JC and I will be wearing blaze orange vests and white hard hats. That will at least 
make us look like city workers, even though there hasn't been a city worker for months. The security team will wear all black, which makes them look more official. Matt, JC, and I all have our sidearms in case we need to engage an enemy. I know everyone just finished their checkpoint duty yesterday. You haven't had a chance to rest up. I wanted to get this done before everyone got a chance to get home and relax for too long. Right now your minds are still in militia mode. You're still sharp. After a week off from your checkpoint duty, we all get relaxed and lose our edge. After the men geared up, Adam did a pre-combat inspection to make sure everyone's gear was up to spec. During the inspection, Jeff asked, Is this stealing? Matt answered, Do you mean when the Republican congressman from the district took an earmark for these solar panels? so he would sign off on the Democrats' common education bill? Yes, Jeff, that was stealing. Money stolen from the American people by the IRS went to buy solar panels for bus stops in one congressman's district. As a representative of the American people, I know I'll never be made whole for all the wealth that has been stolen from me through egregious taxation and federal money printing. But I'm willing to accept these solar panels as a partial concession. Matt wasn't smiling when he said it, but the rest of the group burst into laughter. Wesley applauded and mimicked a cheering crowd. The men mounted up and drove on to Louisville. They got off on 9th Street, decided that would be the western border of the operation. It was just as Eddie's sister had said. The glass was busted out of every single shop. There was no, no one around, but there was nothing left to loot was an eerie scene, like something out of a sci-fi horror movie. They came to the first bus stop. Adam and Matt quickly jumped on top of the shelter and assessed the tools needed to remove it. Matt looked at the connectors and said, Now these are standard MC4 solar connectors, which just pop out. The screws have a special tamper-proof head. It's a Torx, a six-pointed star head. Adam, do you have a driver for that? Adam answered, I have a driver with multiple attachments. It has a Torx, Torx that will fit, but I only have one. I'll work on the screws while you disconnect the connectors. JC said, I'll start taking apart the lighted display. This held a very cheap 10 amp charge controller and a 200 watt inverter. JC showed them to Matt, who said, They only served to light the advertisement in the bus stop shelter, so they didn't need to be high powered. Nevertheless, if we can get several of these, it'll put out a lot of juice. That battery is even more of a joke. It's only an 18 amp hour cell. On a positive note, it's 12 volts. Several of them could easily be wired together produce, to produce a higher capacity. They quickly moved on to the next bus stop shelter. There was no one around, so two of the six guys working security 
got involved with removing the panels to make things go faster. It would have helped to have another Torx head driver to remove the screws. When they got to the fourth bus stop, Adam said, you guys get in the hang of this. We're moving along pretty fast. By 8.30 a.m., they had cleared five bus stop shelters of the panels, inverters, cables, charge controllers, and batteries. It was going to be an all-day job. Adam reminded everyone, regardless of what we have at 4.30 p.m., we're going to pull out. I want to make sure we can drive through Lexington well before sundown. As far as cities go, Lexington is about the best shape of any of them, but that sure isn't saying much. The first part of the day went pretty smooth and no one bothered them. They saw a few solitary stragglers moving by on occasion, but none were in a hurry to take on a well-armed militia. The team took turns eating lunch and using this screwdriver to remove the specialized star screws. At roughly 2.30 p.m., they stopped at a bus stop in front of an old building on Broadway. They came face to face with several Mexicans exiting the building. The Mexicans looked as startled as the militia. The security team quickly raised their battle rifles to a ready position. The Mexicans lifted their hands as they came out of the building. The Mexicans had several lengths of copper pipe that they let fall to the ground as they raised their hands. The Mexicans slowly backed away and the security team slowly lowered their weapons without a word one to the other. Adam said, okay, that wraps it up, we're heading home. JC said, I don't think they're much of a threat. I think they're just scavenging like we are. Adam replied, yeah, but we don't know who they're scavenging for. They may be getting that copper for a gang that uses it for building stills to make liquor. We could be seen by them as a threat. I don't want to take that chance. We're rolling out. Everyone nodded and loaded up. The two trailers were fairly full, and one truck bed was half full of cables and batteries. It was a good haul, well worth the trip, if they could get home safely. They passed through Lexington at just after 3.30 in the afternoon, and as they turned from I-64 east to 175 south, Two Kentucky Highway Patrol cars pulled in behind them with their lights on. Adam picked up the walkie and alerted the other two drivers. There's no way these guys are real cops. We weren't even speeding. They have no reason to pull us over. Besides that, have any of you seen a cop in the last month? If they were real cops. They'd have something to do besides pull over random drivers. I think this is a robbery. Jeff, you're in the rear. See if you can tell how many there are in the front car. Jeff radioed back a few seconds later. Looks like two. Lee says they're in uniform. Adam said they would be. Wouldn't be believable if they weren't. I don't think they'll just let us keep rolling back to London. I think if we don't stop, they'll pick a target and start shooting at the tires. Best thing we can do is make a coordinated stand. Okay, well, let me think for a minute. Everyone was quiet. No one 
wanted to do this, but there were no good options. There were only bad options and worse options. Minute later, Adam called back on the radio to everyone. Jeff, slow down a bit, back them up off the trailers. We'll jump up ahead and then pull over. When you get to us, pull over behind us slowly to give us time to get ready. When you pull over, cut your truck sideways. We'll all jump out and run up to your truck. If we have to engage, we'll have the truck for cover. No one said a word. Adam called back. Is everyone on board with that plan? JC called back. 10-4. Jeff called back. Roger. The two trucks pulling the trailers shot forward, then pulled over. Jeff slowed down, then pulled in sideways behind the trailers. Jeff and Lee both jumped out of the passenger side, so they were behind the cover of the truck. Adam, Wes, Matt, and the others were at the truck by the time the men in the highway patrol cruisers got out. Adam called out, We're in a mission from the Kentucky Liberty Militia. I'm ordering you to stand down. The first men, man yelled, You men are all under arrest. Come out from behind that truck. Adam said softly, Everyone pick your target. The militia members in the rear raised their rifles over the bed of the truck. Those in front raised their rifles over the hood. The man who appeared to be in charge raised his shotgun and yelled, Drop your weapons! Adam called to his team, Fire! The militia men fired. The front men in the highway patrol uniform fired one shot, then crumpled to the ground. The man near him fell before he pulled the trigger. The two in the back ran back toward the patrol car. One limped as he'd been shot in the leg. The militia ceased fire, except for Adam, who yelled, Keep firing! The rest hesitated, but then resumed firing. The man who was limping fell to the ground after several shots hit him in the back. The other made it to the car, and as soon as he pulled out from behind the other patrol car, Adam had a good shot at the man's head through the windshield. He took the shot. The windshield shattered. The driver slumped forward, and the vehicle rolled to a stop. Adam kept his rifle sight on each downed man as he went to kick away their weapon and put two extra rounds in each of their heads as he passed. The rest of the militiamen watched as he moved with cold indifference. To the other men it was frightening. To Adam it was work. He took no pleasure in it, but this is the way he had been trained. Like it or not, this was the best thing for his men. Adam's brother Wesley was the only one who had the courage to say what many of them weren't thinking. What if they were real cops? Adam's reply was sharp and without remorse. If they were real cops, they violated their duty by pulling over a convoy of trucks for no reason. They then violated their duty by not complying with the military order. Lastly, and most importantly, they violated their duty by trying to arrest us without cause. I bet you a week's worth of Kalmykin that those badges don't have matching IDs. 
on their photos. But even if they do, they were rogue cops turned highway bandits. And that's worse than a regular highway bandit. Either way, there's no place for their kind in this world. We are at war, gentlemen. Wesley hated milking cows. Not that he detested the chore itself, but he hated getting up so early. He was tempted to take the bet, but he knew Adam was probably right. Besides, he had no desire to go rifling through a fresh corpse's pockets. Adam said, collect the weapons. Lee, Jeff, check the cars for ammo and anything useful. Wesley, Matt, pop a hole in their gas tanks and let's get that gas in our trucks. Matt and Wes looked for some containers. Matt found a few empty water containers the men had used throughout the day. They saved their empty plastic bottles to refill and reuse. Six months ago, everything was disposable. Now nothing was. Wes slid under the first car and very slowly poked a small hole with his knife in the bottom of the gas tank. He was careful not to create a spark that could blow them all to kingdom come. Once the hole was there, the fuel began to trickle out. Matt bent down to hand West an empty bottle and take the full bottle. While West was caught, the fuel running out the tank, Matt ran the filled bottles to the trucks. When they finished, they'd had about eight gallons from the first car. Gary and Lee were already working on the fuel from the second tank when Matt and Wes finished. This process took longer than the other task of clearing the vehicles of useful supplies. The cars yielded a couple boxes of 12-gauge shotgun ammo, 50-round box of 40 caliber pistol ammo, and two 50-round boxes of 9mm pistol ammo. When the weapons were collected, they had a 40 caliber S&W, a 45 caliber Colt 1911, a 9mm Springfield 1911, and a 9mm Sig Sauer. The shotguns also ran the gamut. There was a Remington 870, two Mossberg 500s, and a Winchester pump. This wide variety of weaponry was certainly not consistent with real police officers. Adam checked for ID and badge wallets on the dead men. The men loaded up and headed home. Matt felt the familiar calm as the adrenaline wore off. His body became tired and he fought sleep on the ride back. No one talked much. Matt wondered if the men had really been officers. Adam didn't volunteer the information and Matt didn't ask. He supposed Adam's reasoning had been sound. The men laying on the side of the road back there were criminals, regardless of what their job had been prior to the crash. And that's it. Patrick Henry said the Constitution is not an instrument for the government to restrain the people. It's an instrument for the people to restrain the government, lest it come to dominate our lives and interests. And I'll read that again tomorrow.